Uh, hello. Uh, welcome back. Um, again, this is Advanced Topics in Paper Recycling, and um, this is WPS 620. Um, what we're going to talk about, and my name is Richard Venditti, and I'm going to be your host, as usual. Um, what we're going to talk about today are two small um, introductory topics on um, some important uh, things that can occur in recycling. Namely, um, we're going to just briefly discuss common contaminants in waste paper or recovered paper. And then we're going to, um, the second topic will be uh, paper strength loss when you recycle paper. Um, and we'll just describe what goes on there. So first topic is uh, common contaminants in waste paper or recovered paper. I need to switch that on the slide. So. Uh, first thing you need to understand about um, paper recycling is that um, when a consumer uses a sheet of paper uh, and then they throw it away, not much thought is, gone into, is going into um, what's going to happen to that paper next. So people will throw um, paper into a recycle bin and not think about what, what's going to happen to the paper clip on it, what's going to happen to the staple, what's going to happen to the ink, what's going to happen to the tape, what's going to happen to the binding. Um, and these can play an important role in how well the recycled um, process um, is. So uh, what we need to understand is basically that um, people somewhat treat recycle bins just like garbage cans. And um, that's bad. Uh, so, uh, but with everybody's hectic schedule and people not knowing um, just simply not knowing the paper recycling process, um, we, we have to expect that that's going to happen. So let's just kind of um, go through a little list of common contaminants in waste paper. And um, we'll start off with the large stuff. And, and you do get large junk in recovered paper. Um, these can include metals, nuts, screws, foils, cans, um, plastics like films, bags, uh, tape. Um, I just took my... Um, newspapers to the uh, local recycling facility and uh, they made a big deal about not putting plastic bags in with the newspapers that that was not a good thing and you can see that those plastic bags are going to have to be rejected you can't make those into paper obviously and uh, it's going to lower yield lo lower the yield of the recycling process and you have to, they, they have to dispose of the bags so um, dirt is a problem when um, newspapers sit on the ground and they collect a lot of dirt that can be a, that's going to be a contaminant and then of course you can get cloth yard waste leather um, anything that you can imagine um, you can get so those are the large junk and they're not too hard to remove but they are a nuisance and we have to make sure that we, our system can handle and remove these things so that um, uh, in, in so that we make good quality paper and so that our process doesn't get um, uh, stopped by uh, this large junk um, f fouling our system. Okay? So for instance, the plastics, if they get downstream into our system, uh, they can uh, cause plugage in, in equipment. Um, the next contaminant is ink and toners. And of course, those are um, contaminants in many grades where we're trying to um, produce uh, uh, printing and writing grades or clean, clean material. Um, and then we've got a category called stickies. Um, stickies are uh, anything that will deposit on equipment. And so it's a broad category. It could be natural or synthetic. Usually um, we think of the most troublesome stickies as pressure sensitive adhesives that come in with the recovered paper um, like uh, envelopes and uh, stamps and things like that. Then we've got coatings. Coatings can be also considered a contaminant. And then fillers, actually. So we know that paper is made out of, in many cases for printing and writing at least, um, has inorganic pigments, um, calcium carbonate, uh, titanium dioxide, clay. And these in certain, in some end products like tissue, are a contaminant. In other end products, um, they may not be a contaminant. And then we've got paper making additives, things like wet strength additives wet strength agents um, can also be considered a contaminant. Okay, so the first category I want to talk about are inks and toners. And um, I apologize, this might be um, 
the print might be a little difficult to see. Um, but uh, what I want to get, this is just going to be the introduction to all this. Um, the point I want to make is that um, there are a large, large variety of printing methods. And they have all kinds of different inks. So there are thousands of different inks. And for each ink, the chemistry is different. So um, when somebody says to you, well, um, I want you to design a recycle plant to remove ink, then um, the next question has to be, well, what kind of ink? And really, the answer is that you've got to remove anything that comes to you. So you've got to field any, any ground ball that comes to you. So um, the point here is, is that um, we've got to have a very flexible system that can handle all kinds of different inks. Um, just briefly, this table shows um, different types of inks um, right here, lists types of inks. And from simple letterpress, um, newsprint and offset, rotogravure, flexographic, um, UV, cured, and specialty. Okay? And under the specialty, um, that's what we're calling toners. And toners are um, actually melted plastics um, and pigments um, that are melted into, onto the surface of the paper. Um, the second column here is the component. Typically, all of these inks have um, uh, a pigment, which gives the ink the coloring, the contrast between the paper and the, um, and the uh, printed thing. And then it has also a vehicle. Okay? And the vehicle might be a mineral oil. Um, it could be water. It could be a solvent. It could be um, a polymer in the case of a toner. Um, and the, actually, the vehicle um, allows the, uh, the printing material to be uh, transported to the surface. And also, in many cases, the vehicle also is the adhesive that makes the pigment coherent and strong and remain attached to the paper. Um, there are different drying systems. That's this column. Um, some of the inks absorb into the web. Others do not penetrate fully into the web or remain on the surface. Um, in the case, uh, case of UV cured, um, we use UV light and we uh, photopolymerize um, the material. And then in, in the case of toners, we, use, um, we actually um, uh, melt the uh, toner, apply it with a little bit of pressure onto the surface, and then, that, and then let it harden by cooling. Okay? And what happens is, because we have different components and drying systems, the ink resin film that is produced on the sheet, um, that can have different properties. So for instance, simple letterpress with a pigment and mineral oil is going to have a very weak ink resin film. So in pulping, you would expect that to be very well dispersed. And at the particle size, this next column, 1 to 15 microns, um, that would, uh, because it's a weak film, it's going to break up into very small particles. And so we'll have to deal with those small particles differently than large particles. Um, if you look at rotogravure, where you have maybe a pigment and now a hard resin and solvent, um, you develop a hard film. And now um, you can see that the particle size, 2 to 250 microns, um, you can get much larger particles. And these will have to be removed with different operations. Um, coming down to the specialty, I'm thinking more or less here about xerographic, laser printers, um, toner printed material. Um, what we can see is that the films that are produced are hard coherent films. They're pol molten polymers that have hardened and they're very strong. We cannot disperse these in water because they're hydrophobic and the particle size um, is generally 40 microns or greater which is uh, 50 microns is a, a nice number to remember because 50 microns in diameter is about what we can see visibly. So you can see that most of the uh, toners are going to break up into um, visible specks that cannot be um, dispersed in water. And those are very hard to remove. Another issue with the toner is that um, because it's melted onto the um, surface of the paper, uh, many times it uh, adheres to the fibers. And during pulping, the fibers stick on to the uh, um, toner particles, and that um, presents a problem in trying to remove them. Okay. All right. Uh, the next topic um, I'd like to just talk about a little bit is what's called stickies. It's got a funny name, 
And um, stickies is currently probably the most challenging problem in paper recycling. Um, if you ask, um, you go to a recycle mill where they're taking in mixed office waste or OCC, some type of sticky is, is typically their main problem in running their machine. Um, uh, these materials, well, let's go to the definition. Stickies contaminants, um, stickies are contaminants in pulp that have the potential to deposit on solid surfaces. Um, that's, the, that's the issue. They can deposit on um, paper machine wires, on press felts, on the dryer cans, and any other equipment in your system. And um, th of course, when we are making paper, um, is all about good formation and having a big sticky deposit on a uh, press felt, for example, where we um, have different um, type of paper making. Uh, there's going to be a different sheet of paper formed when there's that sticky on that press felt than other places where the press felt is clean. Um, for that reason, uh, we don't want deposits, obviously. Um, these stickies are typically uh, organic materials. They, are, um, they can be man-made, such as um, self-pressure-sensitive um, self, uh, adhesive stamps, for instance, or they can be um, natural, and that would come from wood, that like pitch or resins from uh, mechanical pulp. Okay? Now, um, stickies also, for these man-made stickies, we can, or even the natural stickies, we can talk about stickies that are um, either water-soluble and disperse in the water, and they can accumulate, and, and if some condition in the process changes, they might deposit. Or they could be non-dispersible, like um, synthetic polymers used in, in um, pressure-sensitive adhesives like polyacrylates. Um, so uh, the last thing is, is um, Okay, we know that stickies, um, it's a bad thing that they um, deposit. But the other problem with these contaminants, these stickies, are that they're very hard to remove in recycling, okay? Um, often these stickies are soft. They have a neutral density. And um, when we try to remove them with um, screening, they can deform and actually um, change their shape and their, change their shape and actually have the ability to um, pass through um, screen openings that um, they wouldn't if they couldn't deform. So um, they're like the, I like to think of them as the uh, superheroes of uh, contaminants. They're able, like Plastic Man, to change their shape and uh, cause us some real havoc. Unfortunately, they're the, they're the bad guys rather than the good guys. Okay, if this works, um, and it's working, um, this is just kind of a demonstration of a pressure-sensitive adhesive. Um, what we have here is this white blob, this gooey mess, is actually a, a little, after pulping, we pulped labels, sticker labels, and with the copy paper, um, you get these blobs, which are the stickies, the pressure-sensitive adhesive particles generated in the pulper. And um, this thing right here is just a, a little, um, metal probe, it's like the size of a needle. And, um, and when, when you touch that adhesive with that metal probe, um, what happens is that um, they adhere to each other. And if we start to move that probe, I'll move it forward, you can see that the motion of that probe, or that there's a little force acting on that stickies particle, well, when that probe is moved, the stickies particle is so soft and malleable that it can deform. And you can imagine that um, you have, uh, and when we take away that force um, and go back to the original um, position of that probe, what you can see is that that adhesive particle has gone back to its original shape. So it has some kind of memory there, this particular particle. And um, that's kind of why I'm, uh, it's very impressive to see these contaminants because you can imagine trying to remove these with um, certain forces and screens when they have the ability to um, deform like this. So one more time and then back. You can see it kind of looks like a booger. Um, it's uh, very stretchy and just bad in general. So that's, that's, um, that's one of the issues that we're dealing with. Okay. All right. Now, um, let's talk about some other things that people don't usually recognize as contaminant. In some cases, coatings can be a contaminant. 
um, coatings are um, usually uh, inorganic fillers like calcium carbonate, for example, and a polymeric binder like a um, emulsion polymer. And um, what happens just like paint, when you paint your wall, we're painting paper. We paint the uh, coating onto the surface of the paper, and then what happens is um, the water dries off, and then we're left with a polymer and the um, calcium carbonate. Okay? Now, when we um, try to recycle coated paper, what can happen is that um, the um, coating binders are somewhat strong, and they um, cause uh, the coating to come off in little chips. Okay? And those little chips are coating flakes. And those coating flakes can be a contaminant. For instance, if you're making brown board, you, you might not want those white chips in your brown board. Or if you're making copy paper, you don't, certainly don't want um, chips of uh, hard plastic material in your copy paper. So if we can grind those down um, in, in pulping or dispersion or kneading, which we'll talk about later, um, we can wash those out. But um, basically, um, we can consider coatings as a, as a general contaminant. Um, Another type of coating that's important um, is wax coating. Many, um, uh, a good percentage of the board used in the United States is coated with wax so that um, the, the box can hold um, wet materials such as ice and um, the contents like um, for chicken boxes to transport um, f frozen chickens. So we wax coat boxes and we can um, actually um, apply the wax to the surface or actually inside the box, inside the fluted medium, um, we can also um, put the wax. So that wax, when we go to recycle it, um, when, it when the wax box first goes into the pulper, those mechanical actions um, break this wax, which is a very um, weak film, and um, break it down into small particles. They're basically suspended in the water as solids if the temperature is um, below the melting point of the wax or as a liquid if the, um, the pulping temperature is above the melting point of the wax. And what happens is as you go through your recycling process, if the wax is not removed, um, what can happen is that the recycled paper that you make or board um, has lower bonding strength, so it's a weaker board. Um, you can imagine that the wax gets between the fibers and prevents good um, bonding. And then the other thing is that the wax um, can make the paper slippery. The coefficient of friction can go down. And you can add additives to increase the coefficient of friction, but those are costly. So um, oftentimes, uh, if you, um, one of the problems is called telescoping with, OC, with um, liner board. If you have a um, board and, um, and you're making it and you're uh, putting it on a reel, and so you have that reel, then what can happen is that that end of the reel actually can telescope out. So what's happening is the inside part is coming out, just like a, a telescope. And um, of course, that's going to be a bad reel because you've got this material out and it's not going to fit on the next converting operation. So um, telescoping can be a big issue. And you can imagine when you're stacking boxes one on top of another in a warehouse, that if the boxes are slippery, they don't, they don't have friction between them, that a box from the top could fall or this stack could slide and, and um, hurt us in the warehouse. So. That's an issue with wax in boxes. Um, the other problem with wax is that it can deposit on machinery in the paper mill. So what, you can, um, what, what you'll notice is that um, if you have a lot of wax, um, you can get this wax buildup on your paper machine wire, on your presses, on your dryers. And you'll have to routinely take your machine down and clean them. So wax is not a good um, material. And that's a coating. All right. Now, even fillers can be considered a contaminant. Okay, fillers are usually um, what happens when you pulp the uh, recovered paper. The fillers are liberated from the fibers, and they go in, they're suspended in the water system. Okay. Now, if we remove the filler from the uh, fibers um, from, let's say, a washing process because these fillers are so small, then um, we lose yield. And that's not good in many cases. But oftentimes, these fillers, because they have small, um, very high specific surface area, they absorb a lot of the inks. So the fillers, even though we put them in as white, um, in the recycling process, they absorb a lot of um, ink 
and um, contaminants, and so they, they become dark, and so we'd like to get those out if we're making high brightness paper. Um, so uh, the other thing that we have to realize is that when we're making recycled tissue paper, we do not want fillers in the, in the pulp going to the tissue making machine because tissue making uses a special paper making process where we actually have the paper, it um, dries on a metal drum and we also have what's called a creping blade. And that creping blade comes down and the paper gets squeezed up against that creping blade and it, it makes the crepes in the tissue, that makes the tissue soft. Well, what happens with that creping blade is if there's a lot of filler in the tissue, that filler actually is an abrasive and that will actually dull that knife and you'll have to change that creping blade, excuse me, um, more often. So um, when you're recycling mixed office waste to go to recycled tissue, you want to remove as much filler as you can because it's just too problematic to have your creping system um, uh, take, having to take that down because of uh, blade wear. Okay, paper making additives can also be considered um, a contaminant in many cases. For instance, if you have starch or gums or retention aids, um, these materials can um, impact the properties of the recycled fiber in a positive or negative way in some cases. Um, but um, Actually, it's just another variable that changes the um, fiber properties that you're getting. Um, additives such as dyes, uh, these cause the fibers to um, have a color. It usually, when you have um, a small percentage, let's say you have 5% of uh, colored paper and 95% white, um, you can't really see the color too much, but um, it will dull or gray the um, resulting re recycled fiber. Um, fluorescent dyes are a big issue. Fluorescent dyes are used to um, artificially whiten copy paper. Um, this copy paper right here probably has some uh, fluorescent whitening agents. What that does is it takes UV light that we can't see. It um, absorbs it into the, in these um, fluorescent whitening agents and then it re-emits it as visible light. So this paper is very bright because we're doing this trick. Um, you may have noticed that when you go to maybe a nightclub and uh, you look at your clothes and some of your, your shoelaces or white stitching is glowing or your white shirt is glowing. Same thing. Um, there's fluorescent whitening agent in the, uh, in the um, detergent that you're using and that gets into the uh, white. Um, that, that you can see that when you have white clothes. Richard, uh, yes. when you held that up it actually made the camera lens adjust and the background got dark if you uh, noticed. Oh no, hold, I it, hold it up again. Okay. Yes, because it is so bright, you don't notice it, but uh, that's right, it's very high brightness. And American um, public have uh, demanded that uh, we have um, very bright white paper, maybe more than what we need. Um, wet strength additives, of course, are problems. If you get a big, um, if you get a, a batch of uh, recovered paper with a lot of wet strength additives, they just simply don't, the water doesn't penetrate the paper, and for that reason in the pulper, it doesn't um, break up into individual fibers. So you get these flocks or chips of unpulped un, um, material, and you can't really um, clean those. You've got to th you throw those away just like you would um, a big chip of a polymer or plastic or a metal. Um, the other thing you can do is um, use a little bit more mechanical action in something called a deflaker or um, a deflaker will try to um, add a little bit more mechanical action and break up those flakes of wet strength added wet strength paper. Okay, so this um, graph uh, just kind of summarizes um, just a general uh, general overview of the uh, contaminants. Uh, what we have here is on our um, let's see on our y-axis right here. Um, we've got degree of difficulty of removal. Okay, so higher up on this axis is harder to remove. Lower on the axis is um, easier to remove. And on the bottom, we've got particle size in microns. Okay, now a micron is um, is one millionth of a meter. So a micron is actually one thousandth of a millimeter. So everyone can picture what a millimeter is. 
Um, a micron is uh, one thousandth of, of a millimeter. Um, so if we take a look at this graph, um, and I'm going to read these out because I, I'm questioning whether you can see them or not. The fiber diameter um, is actually about, um, if we come down to here, um, and this is on a log scale, this is going to be about 20 microns. So a fiber diameter is about 20 microns. And a fiber length, that's this term right here, fiber length right here, if we come down, we would expect a fiber length to be about 1,000 to 3,000 microns. Okay, And let's think about that. Um, generally, we know that hardwoods are about one millimeter and softwoods are about three millimeters or so. So what we're seeing is that the fiber length here is corresponding to about one to three millimeters. That's, that's what we would expect. Okay, so these aren't contaminants, but we put these, the fiber diameter and the fiber length on as references. Now we can take a look at some other contaminants. We've got ink, stickies, and ash. They all have very small sizes, okay? And because they, their size is small and similar to fibers size, they're very difficult to remove. For instance, if we were trying to sort fibers from ink, stickies, or ash, we'd have a hard time sorting by size because they're of similar size. And um, the problems actually uh, multiply when, we, when you think about, we're going to try to process maybe 400 to 1,000 tons per day of the um, incoming recovered paper. And so we can't just sit there and selectively pick these inks and stickies and ash out. We've got to have processes that handle huge quantities, volumes of this material and do it very rapidly without trouble. Okay? Now, as you go down um, the contaminant list here, we've got sand and grit, which is a little bit easier to remove. Now, you see it's about the same size as the fire, but it's got a higher density, so we'll, we'll, we'll use density to remove um, sand and grit. Um, plastics, uh, they can be the, about the same size of a fiber or they can be much larger than a fiber. Um, so plastics can be, um, are a little bit easier to remove because they have a low density and oftentimes they are much bigger than fibers. Um, staples, um, typically larger than a fiber, so that's an, that, that helps in the ease of removal and also they're much higher density. So we'll, we'll use both of those characteristics to remove staples and other small metal contaminants. Now you get into things that are really easy to remove but are a nuisance. Um, cans, metal cans, um, glass and plastic bottles, and then even here we have an engine block just to make the point that you can expect everything. Mannequins and CDs and wallets and all kinds of things in, in your um, recovered paper. But an engine block, obviously, what I like to think about is that the engine block is the, doesn't look, smell, taste, um, like a fiber at all. So the point here is that that's why, because it's so different from a fiber, that's the reason why it's so easy to remove. Okay? And hopefully, um, if you're at a recycle mill, you won't see a lot of those, but there's a chance that you will. Okay. All right, so I've mentioned that there's a long laundry list of contaminants, and um, they have different sizes. And the, the other thing that usually is shown is what's called um, the contaminant size versus removal efficiency. So actually this top curve right here, um, we've got particle count. So this is a particle distribution curve. And here we have particle size. And this is typically of inks and toners. Um, this is 2 um, microns, 10 microns, 30 microns, 100 microns, and 300 microns. And let's recall that a fiber length is about 1,000 microns, and a fiber diameter is around 20 microns. So what we notice is that when we repulp paper that has different inks, we're going to get a large distri size distribution of particles. Okay? And so what we'll have to do is we'll have to use different unit operations to remove the different types of particles. Um, for instance, for very small particles, this graph right here, this is saying washing is effective in removing these small particles. So if you've got a particle less than, let's say, 5 microns, around 2 microns, you're going to have a high um, a removal efficiency in washing. And down here, this curve right, this is the removal efficiency of different unit operations. This curve right here corresponds to washing. And um, what you see is this is 100% removal efficiency. So you see that um, 
for very, and this is particle size that's trying to be removed. Washing has got almost a near 100% removal efficiency for very small particles, and washing um, efficiency decreases with larger particles. Um, the next unit operation shown down here is flotation. You see it has a maximum in particle size removal efficiency um, at a size a little bit greater than uh, washing. So flotation can be used to remove larger particles that aren't removed in washing. For instance, toner specks can be removed with flotation, but these larger toner specks cannot be removed with washing. So a lot of cases, we will combine washing and flotation in one recycle operation. And then for even larger materials, we can use centrifugal cleaning um, and screening. Centrifugal cleaning is going to remove based on density differences, but in general, um, it removes larger particles than washing or flotation. And then finally, um, screening, where we allow good fibers to pass through small holes or slots and the big contaminants to be screened out away from them, of course, the screening is going to have very high efficiency if those um, contaminant particles are much larger. They'll be easier to remove. So the point here is that we've got a lot of different contaminants, different sizes, and we're going to need to put together different unit operations in series that work together as a team to remove all the different contaminants that we might expect coming in in our recovered paper. Okay, so just as a little review, um, and this has a review from actually last week. True or false, the percentage of paper that is recycled overall is about 50%. Um, if you recall from last week, yeah, 50%. That was an easy number to remember, and it's about 50% recovery in the United States. Um, the four major grades of recovered paper are, and wow, this is ch testing my memory. Um, let's think about it. We had um, old corrugated container. Remember that? Those are our brown container board boxes, container boxes. Then we had newsprint, which was a category that um, mainly had um, pulps that were, uh, had mechanical pulp in them um, that actually still had the lignin in them. And then a third category that we can think about um, is, and I lost my pointer, third category would be mixed, mixed grades, where you have a mixture of different types of papers, maybe coming from an office or houses or whatever. So you have mixed grades. And then finally, the last category was a category that I, I like um, to use uh, pre-consumer waste. So these are pre-consumer waste, and we broke it down into two subcategories. One was um, pulp substitutes. They, didn't, they have no contaminant. The pulp substitutes actually, no glue, no ink or anything like that. They're going to be high value, and you can just use them as a pulp substitute. So you can just put them in water, disperse them, and put them on a paper machine. Um, the other material uh, in that category was called high-grade de-inking. It was pre-consumer. It was very consistent, um, homogenous material, but it might have had a little bit of ink or a little bit of contaminant, and so it needed to go through a um, recycling process to, in order to um, run it on a paper machine. Okay, uh, last question, true or false? Basically, contaminants are similar in shape, strength, density, etc. That one's obviously false. Um, we went through a long laundry list of contaminants, and they have different properties and sizes and different removal efficiencies. Um, so there's uh, quite a difference in contaminants. And we've got to, as recyclers, expect anything to come through our door. All right. That's going to conclude the uh, introduction to recovered paper contaminants. And so um, that's just a brief introduction. We're going to come back a little bit more um, and talk a little bit about ink and its chemistry and structure later. But for now, that's um, where we'll leave it. And um, the next topic I want to pick up on is the introduction to the effect of paper recycling on fiber properties. And actually, that title should be Fiber and Recycled Paper Properties because we're going to talk both about what happens to the fiber and how that um, affects the um, the properties of the recycled paper. Okay, so our learning objectives. We want to understand how recycling affects chemically pulped fibers, and then we also want to understand how recycling affects mechanically pulped lignin-containing fibers. And you might think to yourself, well, why did I break it down into those two categories? And the reason why is because the difference in the effects are very, um, are very significant. They're two completely different processes that are going on there, so we'll break them up conveniently that way.
Okay, in general, let's start to talk about chemical pulps. And in general, what are some of the effects that recycling has on the um, chemical pulp? Well, first of all, when you wet and dry and then run the fibers through pumps and through pulping and, and other mechanical actions, we get mechanical damage. Okay? So what can happen to the fiber is the fiber may be cut or small fine particles might be um, knocked off the um, fiber. Um, if our recycling process um, has a lot of washing, where, um, where we're removing small particles like filler, it will also remove a lot of fines. Okay? So we may have, after a, um, a um, washing intensive recycling process, a loss of fines, even less maybe than um, the virgin fiber. Um, the next category uh, event that occurs or process that, that we need to talk about is a process with a funny name, hornification. And uh, this hornification, as you can imagine, is um, actually making the fibers um, somewhat horny, stiff, like a, like a bull's horn, let's say. Um, that's a good way of putting it. Um, the hardening and stiffening occurs because of the wetting and the drying cycle. We'll go over that. And because these fibers become stiff, um, what happens is when they go into paper, um, they don't um, generate as much bonds and the bonds aren't as strong. And that's because the fibers are less conformable. We'll talk about that. So there's a weakening of paper bonding, usually, if you just compare um, virgin to recycled fibers. And then oftentimes, if our recycling process isn't perfect, it never is, um, there may be a decreased cleanliness. Not always, but in some cases, there can be a decreased cleanliness. What are we talking about? Lower brightness, um, maybe some residual ink or toner. Uh, maybe even, a, a, unfortunately, a sticky particle in the paper. Okay, so just as a review, chemical pulping. Let's talk about what happens during uh, chemical pulping. Um, this picture right here shows you um, uh, just kind of a generic, uh, kind of a schematic of the fiber wall as it would appear in the tree. And in this picture, um, the white areas like this right here are cellulose um, fibrils, small fibrils, okay? They're called photofibrils, and those are in the wall. And then we also have a lignin and hemicellulose matrix that acts kind of like the glue to keep these um, stiff cellulose chains or fibrils um, implanted in, in the um, wood cell wall. And of course, the tree needs a very strong, stiff um, wood structure so that um, the tree can withstand um, the weight of carrying the leaves and, the, uh, um, and also just to resist um, wind and things like that. So this wood structure is very, very stiff. Now, in, when we do chemical pulping, we usually use sodium hydroxide and sodium sulfide in pulping. And then in bleaching, we're going to use things like peroxide, we're going to use chlorine compounds. And what will happen is we will, those chemicals hopefully will attack mo mainly the um, lignin matrix. Okay? And what we're doing is we're attacking these lignin matrix and we're um, solubilizing some of it. The effect is that um, we get holes or voids or pores in the cell wall structure. Now what you notice is if this is a hole, this fibril and this fibril now can move independent of each other. Previously in the wood, they were glued together. Now they can move independently. And that's really what causes um, the fibers to be more flexible than the actual fibers in um, wood. I've got an example of that. If, um, if we take a look at this stack of paper, um, this stack of paper, if I try to flex it, it can flex. It's very flexible. It has a low bending stiffness. Why? Well, if you look at the edge of the paper, you notice that the layers of the paper, actually, those layers, um, they're moving independently of each other. Okay? And so this layer right here is higher than this layer down here. It's kind of hard to see. But the point is you can do this yourself. You see that there is a very low stiffness. And it's because the layers can move independently of each other. They can slide past one each other. Now, if you take that same, um, same thickness of one sheet of paper, Let's say we took all these sheets of paper, we glued them all together. So we just spot glued them so that they couldn't slide past each other. As hard as I could try, that would be extremely stiff. I can't, I couldn't bend that. 
And that's, that's what gives fibers and other material flexibility. It's the, it's the fact that if it's thick, if the layers can slide a, a one past another, it's going to be flexible. If, they're, if they can't slide or move independently, it's going to be very stiff. So that's the same point in the fiber. So if we come back to our diagram, um, what we'll see here is that in this case, on the right, after chemical pulping, those fibers are more flexible because these fibrils can um, move independently of another. But on the, uh, in the wood structure, uh, I did it again, the wood structure, it's, um, the fibers are stiff because these glue, the glue here in the lignin is keeping those fibers together. All right, so that's chemical pulping, and that's how it makes fibers more flexible. Um, now, what do we mean by hornification? It's a funny term. Well, A, if we look here on the left, if we look at um, this picture right here, A, what you notice is that we've got this, this is part of the structure of the wall, okay? And the structure of the wall has been opened. You can look at, think of it as layers now. And the lignin's been removed, and the structure of this wall has been opened from chemical pulping and also from refining. And as that fiber wall starts to dry, so B is at 30% consistency, um, we start to get um, connections between each layer of this wall. So now this wall and this wall can't move independently from each other. And then as we dry, now the wall can't move at all independent. These little layers cannot move independently at all. And then finally, D is when we're greater than 75% consistency. Now all the moisture is left. All the walls have glued together. And, and how can they glue together? Well, the reason why is because there's hydrogen bonding between the cellulose molecules. So they've all glued together. Now nothing can move independently. We get a very stiff, stiff fiber wall and, of course, a stiff fiber. Um, if you look at the cross sections, here's after craft pulping, maybe refining. And then as we dry, we see some of the fiber wall collapse. And then finally, in C and D, we actually see shrinkage of the fiber wall. Okay? So we think about um, around B, around 30% consistency, irreversible hornification starts to occur. That's where we get this shrinkage and the um, irreversible gluing of the different layers together. So that's what's called hornification. It's when we dry the fiber, and the, that drying of that fiber glues those layers together. And they, those layers cannot open up very effectively. So here's another picture. Here we have our never dried chemical pulp fiber. And then what we do is we swell that fiber with water. We actually open up those um, voids that chemical pulping started by removing the lignin. How do we swell the fiber with water? Well, we use refining. Refining uses mechanical action to bruise and um, break, break layers of um, this um, fiber wall open. And then the water actually can swell in there. So we're swelling the fiber with, when we refine it with water. Now it's very flexible. When we make paper out of that virgin fiber, now we get these dried collapsed fibers. Okay, and those are called hornification. So we actually, we get a nice strong structure in the sheet of paper and the fibers have conformed to each other and they've made strong paper, but now they're hornified. Okay, so we take that hornified fiber and when we re-wet it during recycling, Yes, the fiber is liberated from the other fibers. It, it's, it does, it, the water um, gets between the fiber-fiber bonding and, individual, and then individually separates the fibers. So now when we re-wet, what happens is we don't go back to this state right here. These layers have been irreversibly glued, and so what happens is um, it's hornified and it does not re-swell. So when we go to make paper out of this, it's not going to be very flexible or conformable, and it's not going to have a lot of bonding area. So it'll make a weaker sheet. All right, so this is just the effect of recycling on some properties for chemical pulp. Um, what we have, the y-axis here, is the percent change in the property. And we're going to start off at 0. And the x-axis is the number of recycles. So here is a virgin pulp. So it's going to have a 0% change. We're going to look at changes relative to the virgin pulp. Here's one, two, three, four, and five recycle cycles. And these are going to be wetting and drying cycles in the laboratory. And um, what you notice is that these three curves down here indicate that the paper is becoming weaker in tensile. Um, this middle curve here that has, I believe it's the squares, is the breaking length. Breaking length is a measure of the tensile strength. And what you can see is from the virgin fiber as you recycle more and more, you're losing tensile strength as you go along. Um, burst strength is these diamonds down here at the bottom. 
and you can see that the burr strength also decreases generally. And what we're getting is we're getting about a 10 or 15 percent decrease in properties over a four or five um, laboratory um, cycles, recycles. The other thing that's shown here is density. Density is the um, uh, unfilled squares, and you see that the density is going down. What that means is that the density is decreasing because the fibers are less flexible. Um, these stiff rods don't pack as well. Okay, so you have these stiff rods, they don't pack as well, so now when they don't pack and conform to each other, there's going to be a lots of voids, so the density will decrease as you recycle. The two curves on the top here are tear and scattering coefficient. The scattering coefficient is related to the unbonded area in the paper sheet. So you can see the scattering coefficient goes up, and that indicates that the unbonded area between fibers is, is increasing. So. That's another indication that we're not getting as much bonding and because the fibers are stiff. Um, the tear strength actually it increases. And um, my understanding is it's increasing because when you tear a sheet of paper, let me try and tear a sheet of paper and give you a demo, free demo. We're tearing the sheet of paper. Two things are actually happening when we're tearing a sheet of paper. One is that fibers are slipping out. The fiber actually slips out of the tear region. And that takes energy. And in the other case, there's fibers across that tear line, and that fiber is actually snapping. And it turns out that it takes more energy to um, slide the fiber out than it, is, than it does to snap the fiber. And what happens is, when you recycle, you decrease the bonding, so the fibers are more likely to slide out rather than snap. And then that actually increases the tear strength. So on this curve here, what you're noticing is the tear is going up because the bonding's not increasing and the tear strength is increasing um, somewhat because of the fact that more fibers are actually sliding out of the um, rip zone rather than are um, snapping. Okay? So in general, we can say that the mechanical properties, they decrease, they decrease the most in the first recycle. So from zero, from the virgin fibers to the first recycle, we see that the um, the mechanical properties are decreasing about 8% here. And then from number one recycle to number five recycle, they're going from about 8% decrease to about, um, let's just say, 10 or so. So you notice that most of the um, changes in the properties are occurring in the first recycle. And then as the paper gets more and more recycled, those changes are becoming less and less dramatic. Okay. Now, these just words just tell you what I just said. Um, so just to, in general, chemical virgin pulp fibers that have never been dried have the ability to swell when refined. They make strong, flexible fibers. Um, the mechanical treatment, the refining, increases the flexibility. The flexible fibers that are never dried conform in the sheet very nicely and make strong paper. When they're dried, the fibers become rigid and they're hornified. Okay? Now, um, this flexible fibers right here, this picture right here, gives you an example of what you'd expect from highly refined fibers that are in the paper sheet, um, virgin, and they um, conform to each other, they're nice and flexible, and they'll make very strong fibers. So that would be a case of refined fibers, virgin fibers. Now, okay, so once these things dry, they're hornified. So previously dried fibers, upon exposure to water, don't swell. They don't become flexible. Those fibers are rigid. And when, when you refine them, um, fines are more likely to occur than with the virgin fiber. So we can, cause, we can create a lot of fines, which is um, bad for drainage on the paper machine, sometimes bad for their properties. Okay? And when these rigid fibers are ma uh, made into fiber, the rigid fibers don't conform. They don't bond as well and you make weaker paper. So on the right here, I'm just showing an example, and, and this is not, the conversion from this fiber to this fiber doesn't occur, but I'm just trying to show you here. If you have stiff fibers that can't conform, let's just assume that they're cylindrical in shape here, um, hornified fibers, then you can see right here is the only the bonding area. They don't conform to each other. We have a lower bonding and, of course, lower paper sheet. So that's Virgin, refined fibers, flexible, strong paper. Recycled fibers, we're getting a, about a 10% decrease overall in um, paper strength. Okay. All right. Now we're going to go to the effect of recycling on mechanical pulps. And um, for mechanical pulps, 
um, the story is quite different. Um, when we um, have a mechanical pulp, um, as you recall, the fiber has just been ripped out of the tree, basically. Not a lot of, there's no chemical action to take out the lignin. So we have those stiff, we have those f cellulose fibrils, and we've got the glue still in there, the lignin, and we get very stiff um, fibers. Um, after, for virgin fibers, what usually happens is we get about 80% of our fibers are these kind of like round barrel shape. And maybe tw 20, excuse me, 20 percent are the flattened ribbon shape. And the flattened ribbon shape are going to make stronger paper. The point here is neither of these are going to make really strong paper, but, um, but this is going to make weaker paper than this. All right, so when you mechanically pulp, you get 80 percent of these, 20 percent of those. You make your paper, it's got a certain strength. It's usually low. When you recycle that newspaper or that um, material that has mechanical pulp in it, um, when you repulp and you run the material through pulpers um, and just any kind of mechanical action, what you're going to do is increase the percentage of flattened fibers um, and decrease the uh, percentage of these round barrel shaped fibers. So you might have more of these flattened shaped. And this 30% is just kind of something to talk about. Um, there have been studies um, in the literature where they looked at the percentage of this versus this, but these are, I think, just ballpark numbers here. And so what you see is we've got more of the flattened fibers, and that's going to make, on second use, this paper stronger than the virgin paper. So that's, a, that's something that not many people can appreciate. Recycled newspapers are typically, all other variables the same, stronger than their virgin counterpart. And then you see after a third use, a third recycle, we, again, we're going to have more mechanical action, more pulping, more pumping, things like that. Now we're going to have a higher percentage of these flattened fibers, and again, our fiber property, the, the strength of the paper that we make out of this is going to be higher. Okay? So it's a completely different story than chemical pulp. Okay, so if we start to look at the results now, um, again we have percent change in properties on the y-axis, number of recycles from 0 to 5 on the x-axis. Here's 0% change for our virgin fiber. And now we see our breaking length is these x's. And there's a little scatter in the data, but these x's are somewhat going up. And what you notice is that um, the uh, x's are the breaking length, excuse me, and the breaking length increases um, about 10% or so um, upon five recycles. So what we see is that the tensile strength of the paper is increasing. Actually, the, uh, these um, unfilled squares here are, is the density. And you can also see that the density of the paper made from the recycled pipe um, fibers is increasing. So that means that the flatter um, fibers from recycling are actually uh, packing better as expected and the density of the paper is going up. So that's great. This curve right here is the burst and you see that there's a very marginal increase in the burst strength. It may be, um, looks to me about two or three percent, but there is some scatter in the data. So, so at least the burst doesn't go down and that's a, a, in contrast to the chemical pulp. The tear remains about the same, maybe a little decrease, and the scattering coefficient is going down. Now let's think about that. The scattering coefficient, um, I told you, is a, um, is a reflection, is related to the unbonded area in the sheet. And so as that scattering coefficient goes down, the, um, the unbonded area in the sheet is decreasing. In other words, the sheet is bonding better because we have flexible, higher density, flexible fibers and higher density paper. So that scattering coefficient is going the way that we thought it would. Okay? So this is a completely different story than chemical pulps. Okay? And this basically just tells us um, what I said in words to describe those graphs. I won't go over them. Okay? So in general, um, actually, let me just go to this graph. I'll, I'll maybe come back to that last one. Um, this one, what I've showed you is kind of misleading. Uh, sorry, um, but I misled you in a simple sense in that we plotted just the percent change in properties. And you saw that the um, chemical pulps were getting weaker and the mechanical pulps were getting stronger. So does that mean that me recycled mechanical pulps are stronger than chemical recycled pulps? No, not even close. Um, I've taken that, I went back to that paper and I took the raw data 
and here's virgin pulp, zero recycles, and one, two, three, four, five recycles, and here is the breaking length, but now I've plotted the, the um, explicit magnitude of the breaking length. This, the red squares, the pink squares down here are the mechanical pulp, and the blue diamonds up here are the chemical pulps, okay? So what we see here is, is just as, as, as we expected from the other data. The chemical pulps decrease in strength, and the mechanical pulps, uh, it's hard to see here, but they increase just a little bit in strength. But here's the difference. The chemical pulps, no matter how much you recycle them, they're still always going to be stronger than the mechanical pulps. So um, these two types of pulps, it shows you the difference, but now I'm kind of showing you the fact that the mechanical pulps, um, even though they increase strength a little bit, they're still woefully weaker than um, the chemical pulps, even after five recycles. Okay, so that's an important to think, thing to think about. Um, sorry for that uh, mislead, but now you know the rest of the story. Uh, okay, so here we're just kind of cat, um, summarizing some of the things that can happen with recycled fibers or pulp, um, the effect of recycled fibers on the paper making process. And one thing is lower freeness. Freeness is the measure of how quickly um, the fibers will drain. and um, if we generate fines because of these stiffer fibers during refining um, or, f or just from pulping and pumping, um, we will decrease our, um, our freeness, that will decrease our drainage rate, that will decrease our machine speeds. So we'll, we might have to add a drainage aid or just live with the fact that we have lower freeness. Um, lower paper strength, um, this is uh, for chemical pulps. So and for chemical pulps, we might get more sheet breaks. Even for mechanical pulps, if we have um, lower paper strength, we could have lower paper strength due to contaminants. All that data I showed you was just unprinted, uncontaminated paper in the lab. In reality, um, even the mechanical pulps might have a, a slightly small lower strength because of contaminants, and that would cause more sheet breaks. Um, we might have low efficiency of chemical additives. What's happening here is that the recycled pulps in general um, generate fines. The fines have higher um, specific surface areas. Those specific surface areas absorb more um, of the chemical additives, so we might have to add more sizing agent, for example. We may have increased deposits, so our, friend, our, our enemies, the stickies here, uh, may um, deposit on our machinery. We might have to have um, regular shutdowns to clean dryer cans or um, felts or wires. And then in general, we might have a decreased cleanliness. We may have some ink deposits and things on our equipment, and the, maybe the paper will be um, dirtier. Depends on how, how well we recycled it. OK, so here's um, just a easy question to make everybody feel good and smart. Um, a pulp produced for newsprint using a CTMP process. CTMP is chemi-thermo-mechanical pulping. It's basically a mechanical pulping process. It helped a little bit with chemicals and, and uh, heat, but it's basically a lignin-preserving, high-yield pulping process. So um, true or false, a pulp produced for newsprint using a CTMP process should have almost equal or better strength properties after recycling. That's true. We found that the uh, mechanical pulps on recycling have about the same or better strength properties. Okay. All right, that will conclude my uh, talk today. We went over two introductory um, topics. Uh, we talked first about um, general contaminants that you'll see in our recovered paper coming in, and we talked about how widely they vary and why that causes us to um, uh, have to need uh, many different unit operations to remove the different things that we might uh, see in our process. And then after that, we talked about, um, in general, how recycling affects fiber properties and, um, in turn, affects um, the paper strength. And we noticed that there's two different stories, chemical pulping. We have the hornification process that makes the fiber stiffer and makes the um, recycled paper weaker. And then for mechanical pulping, uh, the, papers, the fibers are, are so... Um, don't make strong paper in the first place, but because they're so um, bulky and stiff. And as we recycle, we flexibilize some of those fibers, and actually the, the paper properties increase just a little bit in strength 
um, because we're flexibilizing the fibers every time we repulp and add mechanical action for pumping. Um, and it's important to remember that no matter how much you recycle mechanical pulps, you won't get up to the strength of chemical pulps. Even though this hornification process is occurring, the fiber structure and fiber chemistry is more important in um, dictating how stiff the fiber is and therefore how strongly bonded the um, paper is and how strong the paper is. Um, that concludes my talk for today and um, I look forward to our next uh, presentation.